This is really about being free to create what you want your life to look like. We each are our own hero. And how do we take the challenges that come our way and see those as the birth process of us becoming heroic? Can you meet that judgment that ultimately will surface with neutrality? This is the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. Hello, everybody. A real quick uh, note that I have a free ebook called Discipline and Finding Your Edge, and it's complimentary, completely free. Please go to traderdiscipline.com and sign up for it. And now sit back, put your feet up, and listen to the legend himself, Tom Sosnoff. I'm so excited to share this interview with you. Enjoy it. Welcome back, everybody, to the Wall Street Coach Podcast. I am uh, so blown away to have our guest here today, the legend Tom Sosnoff. Uh, Tom is a true trailblazer in the online brokerage industry. He's been driving innovation and financial education for investors and traders on all levels. Uh, he goes back to 1981 when he was a former floor trader and he was 23 years old. Uh, he came, became one of Chicago's most well-known serial entrepreneurs in fintech. He built a breakthrough options trading platform, Thinkorswim, and later sold it to TD Ameritrade for $750 million. Tom is the foremost expert in the world of retail options trading, leveraging over 20 years of his experience as a market maker for the Chicago Board Options Exchange and one of the original OEX traders in the S&P 100 index pit. Tom pursued his vision to educate retail investors in options trading and built a superior trading platform and a brokerage firm that specializes in options. With that vision in mind, Tasty Trade was founded in 2011, and six years later, Tasty Works launched. He's also the creator of the Tasty Trade Financial Network, the largest online digital financial network in the world. He's also the creator of the small exchange and sold that not long ago for 250 million. And his Tastyworks online brokerage, he recently sold to IG Group for one point billion. And if that isn't enough, he also played poker with Michael Jordan for 15 years. Welcome Tom to this podcast. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> that was that was long and wonderful. Thank you. It was long and wonderful because it is a long and wonderful life you've lived. And the thing that is so impressive to me about you is how long you have been striving to be a contribution to traders, retail traders, and individual investors. What was the fire in your belly to do this? Oh, I mean... I don't know, life just goes by really fast. And, you know, you, you just, decades go by, you kind of blink and a decade goes by. If you love what you do, you know, it doesn't really feel like it's been that long. Yeah. Kind of feel yep. like it's, uh, kind of feel like we're still in our twenties, just fooling around. So I don't know. I mean, it doesn't, um, I've never, I've always been busy, so I've never thought about it. Yeah. Well, you seem to care about the little guy, I want to say. And I'm just curious what informs that because the vision you've stepped into so many times ultimately is assisting a cohort of people that in a lot of ways, I don't think the financial world has uh, respected, paid attention to in the way that you did. Um, you know, when we first left the trading floor and we started to build Thinkorswim and we started to learn about the retail business, um, the, we, we also built an institutional platform that nobody really knows. And it was used by a lot of institutional um, different brokerage firms like UBS and um, uh, Citigroup and, and uh, um, Deutsche Bank, what, what became Deutsche Bank and uh, other places like that. And uh, um, probably Merrill, and I forgot all the other firms. And I realized really on in my career, oh my God, I hate the institutional business. You know, <laughs> I don't like, I don't like building. I mean, everybody was nice. I just was like, I don't like really building software for them. Business isn't sticky. There's too much bull, bull crap. Um, and I really liked the retail side of the business from day one because everybody was so appreciative of, you know, mm -hmm. spending some time. If you could spend time with them, if you could, you know, I mean, 
we weren't even asking for anything other than, you know, hey, check out our software. And everybody was so damn nice wow. and so appreciative and so willing to learn that um, that I just completely lost interest in, you know, the, the institutional side, the hedge funds, the big corporations. And I've spent now the last 23 years, um, I won't even do an institutional event. Like I'm 100% retail. Mm -hmm. um, and I won't build any more software for the institutional side. I won't do anything. And I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm just like the customer side. It's way more fun. Um, it's, it's, there's a different level of appreciation for like building cool technology and for knowledge and stuff. So I, I've hung out here for the last, you know, since 1999. Yeah. Well, I kind of, can't help but wonder if that's because you are an entrepreneur at heart and the individual investor and individual trader, they, I see them as entrepreneurs. I, I see everybody as, um, in the, in the world of self-directed investing, I do see an element of entrepreneurship with, in, and at least, you know, the do it yourself attitude with most individual investors. But, um, and I think that that's, you know, clearly um, a common characteristic. I also think that it's an incredibly smart customer base. Like this is, you know, um, one of the things that we've attracted over the last couple of decades, because we have built some really cool technology, is we've attracted some really smart people who yeah. never before were challenged by, by third parties. You know, they might've been challenged at work. They might've been challenged at school but they were never really challenged by third-party technology or third-party content. And we built this stuff to challenge people. Like when we first, I remember we first built our technology, we built it in a way that we said, we're not supporting all these old pieces of all this old soft, you know, operating systems and old software and old screen sizes. Cause you know, people are like, well, you'll never make it if you don't support, you know, whatever it was, you know, Windows 96 or something, or, you know, and we're like, I don't care. We're just building up. And, and they were like, you know, this business is never going to make it if you guys only do, you know, complex options and all this other stuff. And we're like, listen, we think there's a market for people that want to be intellectually challenged. Yeah. And so we started challenging people. And when we say intellectual, intellectually challenged people, it wasn't like we were rocket scientists at all. It was just that we had a different domain skill and mm -hmm. people wanted to learn it. And so that was cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I, I loved what you said in your TED talk uh, about risk and that we need to, as a culture society, get more comfortable with risk. I feel that that's, it, it's almost like perhaps you see the best version of what we're capable of individuals. And I sense you are encouraging us and prodding us towards that. There was, um, you know, I always pick on like, you know, the Jack Bogles of the world and the passive, the, the leaders of index funds and passive investing, because I don't think it was, it wasn't like it was disingenuous. It wasn't like they didn't believe in what they're building. It's just that I don't know that they really recognized in the passive world um, how far behind they set the investor as far as know-how. Like what I mean by that is there's, there's, there's two really interesting arguments out there. One is if you're 23 years old and somebody gives you $2,000, and they say, here, take this $2,000 and you can make a, and put it away in something passive. And the S&Ps are going to be up, you know, six or 7% a year for the next 50 years or whatever it is. Or let's say, let's say till you're 50. So for the next 30, 32 years or something till you're 52 or 55, whatever. And you put it away in a passive investment and, you know, you'll average about six or 7%. Sometimes you'll have a 30% drawdown. Sometimes you'll have a 30% winner but you don't have to do anything. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. And then at the end of you know, 32 years or whatever it is, you're gonna have a reasonable amount of money and then you're gonna thank us for putting you on this path. And then there's the other school, which is, which is our school, which says, hey, although that sounds good, that is the absolutely the wrong approach. And 99 out of 100 times, I would tell that same 22 or 23 year old, listen, take that $2,000, 
and go out and make a hundred trades. I don't care what you trade, trade stocks, trade options, trade futures, lose the $2,000. doesn't mean a damn thing at this point in your life. And everything that you're going to learn about entrepreneurship, business, market structure, strategy, risk, um, probabilities, you know, just, just, just the quantitative aspect of, of blowing through that $2,000 is going to make you a hundred times more successful long-term than that person that put that $2,000 away and had no idea what they did with it for 35 years. Yeah. And, and I really believe that. And I would say that a hundred out of a hundred times, but that goes absolutely counter to what financial service companies on Wall Street have been saying for the last you know, 50 years. I mean, it's completely counter. Even today, you know, the Wall Street Journal and, and um, various financial media publications, they would all say the same thing. Wow, compound interest, you know, passive investing, risk, any, anything you want to do over risk-free rates is the way to go. And I think it's actually, you know, it's archaic in thinking. It doesn't, you know, we've come so far technology-wise and market structure and product-wise. It, it makes no sense to me at all, but that's the way people still think. But, but when has this culture or Madison Avenue been an advocate of people being the authority of their life? Um, well, they, they do in a lot of things other than investing, you know, so, you know, but it's in to, their best they, interest financially to not advocate we become self-sufficient. Um, I mean, you would like to think that that would be what they should do, but for some ridiculous reason, everybody tells you not to sit back and be passive in your life about anything except finance. Exactly. When you, th when you think about it, it's so crazy the hypocrisy in that statement it's absolutely insane and and yet that is the message you know even today i mean there's still re every new book that comes out on wall street it's the same crap you yeah. know it's the same same discussion and it doesn't i i just don't get it yeah. um i'll never get it and you know listen I i'm just... convinced that that the reason for our successes over the years is just because you know what? We became really good at taking risk. We're not any smarter than anybody else. Well, you you did speak about all of the millions you lost as you first became an investor, and how all of those losses are the bedrock of the education that informed your ability to build, think, or swim. Yeah, I still have plenty of million. I mean, like the numbers are bigger today. But I still make many of many, many million dollar mistakes. And when I say mistakes, I mean, um, you know, bad investments and, and things that just don't work out. And um, but, you know, I mean, I still take shots in, in the sense that I mean, obviously, I, I don't do things that I think are reckless, right. but I still do things that um, I take an enormous amount of risk in my life. I don't need to. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of do it because a I, I think it. I thrive on it and B it's, you know, it keeps me going. Yeah. Um, so I still do it this day and yeah, we still have lots of horrible trades. And then of course we've had some great ones too. And the great ones are way better than the bad ones. That's all. What has this year been like for you personally? Uh, you know, we had some conversations, you and I, probably around the time the IG group was taking place and your ability to be stoic. I, I just can't imagine the uh, stress level of being in the middle of having a $1.1 billion deal. So how do you stay? Oh, yeah, that, that's nothing. I mean, I, the, <laughs> money, the money doesn't even, like when you do deals and stuff and you're building stuff, the money is actually completely irrelevant. Like none of us even think, I, I know that's kind of like a, weird thing to say and if you have money it's easier to say it but um we become very immune and indifferent to money and deals like that you know like if there's there's a giant game we play and 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 my legacy is all about building cool stuff and when the stuff works out that's awesome and when it doesn't you know that pisses me off but um <laughs> I don't really, the numbers aren't like crazy important to me. Um, I just feel like you have to keep making deals and doing things in order to um, not get bored. 
Yeah. And I like also like to make deals so to give me the opportunity to get in front of more people to, um, you know, I'm a promoter, you know, I'm not really, uh, I'm not, I'm not a good operator. I'm not a great manager. I mean, it's not my thing. I like to build stuff and I like to promote stuff. Um, yeah. And I let other people, you know, run stuff Yeah. Uh, because I don't really get off on running stuff, but, um, but I do like, you know, I still love, you know, I've got, Right now, I've got multiple projects, multiple development projects going on, and you know, still doing our show and stuff. I mean, I love talking to customers and and you know, just shooting the shooting the crap and yep. and bullshitting all day. And you know, I mean, we we built like a giant locker room, and it's yeah. great. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. And just for our audience, every single day, Tom offers uh, his opinion, his expertise on the Tasty Trade Live. It's a daily on the Tasty Trade Network. You can see him every day. Am I correct that I believe you said you take between 75 and 100 trades a day still? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you right now, today, today I made about 100. I mean, uh, actually... 81 trades today um but i trade that much every day i just like doing stuff i love trading i'm mm -hmm. one of the only ceos in this space that actually trades and actually uses their own platform and and actually trades every market um i'm kind of a junkie in that regard but i don't let it get in the way of you know of everything else that we do yeah. um my most important role is to is to build cool stuff and and um you know and and work on the network with you know, with my buddies and, and edutain, mm -hmm. um, a very live, a very large live audience yeah. that, um, you know, we do a show about personalities. Mm -hmm. We, we tasty trade is about us and how, how we weave our lives into finance mm -hmm. and there's no news, no guests, you know, it's a very different type of financial discussion, all strategy, all quantitative and all bullshit. And when I say bullshit, just like, just like us, you know, talking about our, our crazy lives and everything else. And yep. so, I mean, I don't want to give that up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and um, unless they, you know, I guess they can fire me. You know? <laughs> I don't think they can, Tom. <laughs> I, think, I think they can technically. Um, I, don't, I don't think they're going to, but I think, they, you know, um, I'll be okay. It's just, uh, um, you know, um, yes. I just like what I do. Yeah, we had we have one question come in on Twitter, and they said that they wanted to know if you uh, do you have a pretty watch list, you change it, and what your night and morning routines are before you trade. But since you're trading all day, I don't know yeah. how you'll so answer usually, that. Usually, usually people ask me if I have any hobbies, and and I don't, which is the really <laughs> scary thing. Like I literally don't have any hobby. I don't do anything. I am the most boring. I'm. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I really like, it's, it's the craziest question. I, I cannot answer. I do not have a hobby, um, mm -hmm. but um, I have a watch list. Sure. And um, I pretty much watch mostly all the futures markets mm -hmm. um, on a, on a, you know, on a, on a continual basis. And then I'll throw a few stocks in there, but my watch list has about a hundred different underlines in it. Um, I customize it, but it is on, I do publish it on the tasty works website and I publish all my trades as well. So it's like, you know, I don't, I don't hide anything. Um, but my watch list is mostly all futures because futures drive the market. Um, although I trade mostly listed options. Um, I also trade some stocks, but on the watch list, I also have, you know, stocks, some, some stocks that I have big positions in like Tesla or Nvidia or, you know, some, you know, all the high flyers type thing. Yep. Um, but I, I basically trade anything that's liquid or anything that's in play. Mm -hmm. What would your advice be right now, first options trader, and then we'll talk about other traders, but for those who are mid-level, halfway experienced, they probably haven't seen a market like this before, um, they may not know how careful they need to be, what would your advice be to them? Well, my advice is that actually nobody knows anything, so like, you know, I've been watching the market every day for basically for close to eight to 12 hours a day for every day for the last 40 years. And I actually could be the most clueless person in the world when it comes to what's going to happen tomorrow, just like everybody else is. So the, my advice is, you know, is, um, uh, is just stay small and keep trading. Like we, like, don't ever think, you know, something cause you don't, 
and nobody knows anything. And there's absolutely not a single person in the world that knows what's gonna to happen tomorrow, the next day or next week. So what you really wanna learn are mechanics around different strategies and you wanna be product indifferent and you just wanna do things small, size kills and trading small is basically the greatest risk management tool out there and it keeps you in the game. Yeah, you know, you, you said just a moment ago about um, the concept of nobody knows anything. And then there was, a, didn't you do a lot of studies around even when you do know, you still don't know? Yeah, sure, we have. And, Talk about you that know, a little. I mean, th there is, the industry is so kind of funny in that everybody tries to figure out things we don't try to figure out anything except optimal mechanics because we recognize the fact that markets you know although they're emotional they're also fundamentally random when i say that i mean i i agree there's positive drift and i understand that markets can be very emotional but i don't actually believe like in quote trends and i don't believe in you know anybody really knowing what's going to happen or that there's going to be a continuation of buying or continuation of selling or any of that kind of stuff but what i do appreciate in the market is that um i appreciate its efficiency and i think that one of the great things about um tasty is that we really hammer home you know that if the markets are efficient and 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 you can define efficiency by a very tight two-sided market and markets are efficient it's just another it's proof that nobody knows anything because you know, there's buyers and sellers that you know a penny away it doesn't make any difference so i once people can appreciate that and they don't think that they're you know they don't think that there's a um uh that there's negative edge because i don't think there is not it's not like a casino or something where you're virtually guaranteed to lose um we're talking about a very efficient marketplace with that you can take either side of the trade on with that with virtually no give up to theoretical it's a very fair place and i think once people can accept that they can focus more on you know being a little more strategic let's just talk about the fair it being a fair place uh what what wound up happening with the meme stocks a while ago uh and there was a lot of accusations around about it not being fair to the retail trader and i've heard your opinion on that but i'd love you to just educate our audience around that it is really fair. Can you just talk a little bit about your, why, what informs your opinion of that, that it is fair? Well, fair is defined by, um, by liquidity. So if there's a lot of liquidity and that liquidity is two-sided, then how could it be anything but fair? I mean, an example of fair is if I said to you, Kim, um, uh, do you, let's just say there's a a, um, a game tonight in Chicago and the and the, it's not the baseball season yet. But let's just say the Cubs were playing, and I said to you, I will give you the Cubs or the Mets, either team. I don't care. And Mets. you can <laughs> Brooklyn-born girl. I gotta go with okay. the Mets. And let's say let's say there's no let's say it's a let's say the, there's no odds on the game. It's just you know both teams are equal, whatever it is. And I said to you. Kim, you can bet on the Cubs or the Mets. It's a pick 'em game, and you can bet as much as you want. Meaning, when I say pick 'em, meaning that you can take either side, and you're not going to pay any kind of vig or any kind of you know juice or there's no there's no. You, if you win, you get it all. If you lose, you lose it all. There's nothing else, and you can do whatever you want to do. Then you'll have to look at that bet and go, "Wow, that's fair. You're letting me bet whatever I want to bet, and there's no." You know, there's no VIG involved. That's the stock market. It's a one penny wide and there's basically no commissions. And we're saying, hey, you know what? Um, if you think this is going up and you think everybody thinks it's going up and you want to say it's going up, fine, go ahead. Here's the market, it's one penny wide. Like I love when people say, well, this, you know, GameStop was, was really unfair. Unfair how? Unfair because the markets weren't liquid enough for this, whoever says that, because that's not true. They were completely liquid the whole time. Unfair because it just went one way up and then one way down. Like, I, like, I don't understand what people mean. It's mm. unfair. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't get it at all. I know people are going to say, well, it's unfair because, you know, Robin Hood shut down for a day and didn't take orders. You know, that was a little bit outside their control. 
and they weren't ready for the moment, but that in itself does not make markets unfair. That makes them incompetent at the moment, you know, but it doesn't, it, you can't impeach the rest of the industry over that. This is, you know, everybody else maintained fair and liquid markets the whole time and all the other brokerage firms were wide open and do whatever you want to do. Um, you know, the, the whole meme stock thing was, um, was, was good for the business because it introduced a lot of people to finance. Yeah. It was bad in the sense that, you know, a bunch of Reddit players thought they could move the markets and actually tried to convince other people that they could. And in the end, it was kind of, they created their own little pyramid scheme, you know, <laughs> yeah. but, but I wouldn't blame the rest of the, I mean, it wasn't like the rest of our firms, you know, were doing, I, I love how they tried to make like Citadel the scapegoat and, you know, and um, Robin Hood the scapegoat and all the, and the regulators the scapegoat. But the reality was, you know, it's pretty much, it was pretty much on Wall Street bets and pretty much on Reddit. You know, that's all. Yeah, I remember you said that Robin Hood just wasn't experienced enough to imagine that outcome and that they kind of dropped the ball. What what, what should they have done? Um, I, I don't know because I'm obviously not involved with them, nor do I care about them at all because uh, they're a competitor and I couldn't care less. But, um, you know, the rate... I, I actually believe that on the on the on the on the professional side of that, the regulators dropped the ball by by raising the requirements for Robinhood, mm -hmm. and then Robinhood didn't really have the know-how to explain to the regulators what was going on and how to how to handle that. So they had to do a capital raise in the middle of all that, which was kind of you know kind of crazy. Um, but I think the idea that like you know the rest of us, the rest of all the firms were just sitting there going. You know, this is interesting, but you know, it's not. <laughs> there's nothing else to it. Like we were, we weren't really sure. You know, we weren't sure how to react because we weren't having any issues. Yeah, none of yeah. us were. Right. Exactly. And so we're just kind of looking at there, like you know, because they're not big enough for the moment. And I don't even know if it was 100% them or just the regulators or it was just a bunch of stuff that was being written. Like, like I don't, like I don't care about that stuff because it's not that interesting to me. What I do think is important about the whole meme stock. Um, episode was that it turned a lot of people onto finance. And it basically was a very transformational moment in the history of the stock market. And it was his, in the history of finance. And I think it was important to the crypto markets. I think it was important to engaging lots of young kids. I mean, they got 10 million people signed up for brokerage accounts, which is very positive. Yes. Um, I'm sure some people lost money because there's lots of people that had no idea what they were doing. They're just pushing buttons and thinking it's free money. But what? at the same time, who cares? Like, <laughs> I don't care that they did. I mean, that it's still like, I'll argue till I'm arguing till I'm dead that the people that lost money because they bought out one share of, of GameStop and they lost $300. That's a very cheap learning experience. Yes. And, and you walked away from that with something that you probably wouldn't gain anywhere else. Yep. which is okay i'm never buying into that kind of hype again that's right you know that's um i'll give you an example my my son at the time let's see he's gonna he's 29 now so at the time he was uh probably 27 and i get a call one night and he's like he's like dad you know i i bought some calls in gamestop and i go and he goes i'm up ten dollars on him and i go wow that's a huge trade he goes are you kidding? I said, I said, I asked him if he sold him. He goes, are you kidding? I'm going to sell him tomorrow, hundred hours higher. And I go, you do realize how I'm going to record this and, and show you in a couple of years, how stupid you sound because the chances that they're up hundred dollars tomorrow is like one in a million, but the chances that you sell these at zero um, is probably pretty good. And he goes, you're so out of your mind. He goes, you're living, you're a dinosaur living in the past. He sold him at zero. <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah. but, you know, again, the, the, there was these, you know, he was like, he was on Wall Street bets, he's reading this stuff. And he's like, you know, Dad, I believe this, this, these guys know, they know way more than you know. And I'm like, Oh, God, I, you know, I, I don't want to root against my kids, but I was rooting yeah. for him to lose all, all his money on that trade. Because <laughs> it's a learning experience. And you know what, he lost all his money. Not all his money, but he lost all the money in that trade. Yeah. And it was a great learning experience for him. And now, you know what? He doesn't say to me, oh, I'm listening to what they're saying. You know, That's he's like, right. 
hey, what do you think about this trade? And, you know. That's right. But I think I remember you said on, I think it was a CNBC interview, you said this, we've been trying to get this younger generation interested in trading and investing for how long, if this is what it took, the small cost yeah. that perhaps is being paid is worth it for them to start to get interested. I, I worked for 15 years. I worked the street in trade shows. I worked college campuses. I, I busted my butt to get young people involved in trading and I did the best I could do, but my audience in that demographic was relatively small, you know, 10,000 people or something, whatever it is. And um, Robinhood came along and the virality of that platform and, you know, it caught on and they introduced 10 million people. And I mean, so I was really happy you know, for their success, because even though they're competitor, they, they opened the floodgates, which was super cool. And they did something that, you know, I tried, but I couldn't do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think it bodes well for their future as well, because that sense of, again, us being the authority of our life, they, these are people I, I suspect as they age, they're going to want to get educated. Your platform's going to be one of the platforms they use to get educated yeah. and That's become okay. that authority of their life. One of the things that's so exciting about the IG group is when you spoke to what you see being able to do with it now, which I'm going to quote you, be able to offer every product to every customer on any strategy anywhere in the world, which no one has ever done before. Wow. Well, that's my goal. And right now we can do that, but it's not as clean as I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And in a few years, um, we'll have that as a very clean, like single platform. You know, right now the regulations, the regulatory limitations around the world you know, as a firm, we can currently offer every product to every customer, but through a single platform, we can't. Mm -hmm. So um, so what my goal is, is to be able to combine, you know, all that technology over the next couple of years into a single platform and then allow customers, you know, depending on where they're located and where, what the regulatory, um, uh, what, what they're allowed to do regulatorily, and and basically, you know, open up the platform to everybody, including um, making it completely decentralized in the sense that it supports, you know, all um, digital assets as well. And when I say digital assets, I mean more than just cryptocurrencies. I mean NFTs, fractional NFTs, digital collectibles, and also be able to transfer money. So it has, you know, basically it has a, uh, you know, a wallet capabilities and everything else so that it really doesn't matter where you are. Like I want to break down yeah. the barriers. You know, there, there's a lot of people, I, I saw the Larry Fink letter that came out today that basically said globalization is dead. And I'm thinking to myself, he is so whacked out if he really believes that. I think it's the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And I think globalization is about to take off. Like the, anybody globalization is dead it makes no sense to me. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the idea that, that, we're, we're going towards a decentralized world. It may not be perfect decentralization um, like, like people dream it's going to be, but it's gonna be a lot more globalization through tokenization than it is going to be in, in, you know, in a year from now or two years from now than it is today. Yeah, yeah. What, what, do you, what do you envision it looking like? Um, I envision there will be, um, a lot more regulatory clarity around decentralization, but I also envision that trading platforms will be um, uh, opened up in, uh, they will include a lot, they'll be much more inclusive, mm -hmm. they'll be much more global, they'll be much easier to um, use secure tokens to trade different stocks in different places. You won't have to worry about clearing, you won't have to worry about data, you won't have to worry about money transfers. Um, because you can do everything instantaneously through crypto. And um, and I think it's going to open up, as we call it, like a world of opportunity mm -hmm. um, in a very dramatic fashion over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we are making our largest capital commitment to um, new technology right now. 
that we've ever made before. And it's almost 100% in the decentralized space, in the DeFi space. So, oh. so we're building, you know, now we're still, we're going to be a year to two years away from releasing anything, but we're committing stuff now to, we're committing to building stuff now that's not even approved um, by the regulators yet. Wow. We're just taking a shot. <laughs> well, your your guesstimates have been pretty solid. So I'm thinking that is uh, brilliant. And I'm excited to hear what that is. I'm kind of curious, just when you look back over all the things that you've done, do you think, what, what was the instinct operating in you as you started Think and Swim, as you started Tasty? What drew you to that? Was it, was it I know this is what's needed, the customers are going to be there, or was it because you just saw that that was something you wish you could do to be contribution? Well, I, I think that, you know, entrepreneurs don't really think that way. Like, you know, hardcore entrepreneurs just like building stuff. Mm. And you don't think like, like, I'm not interested in people that are trying to solve a problem. Mm. In, in the world of business and entrepreneurship, if I'm making an investment, I'm not looking for people and ideas that are trying to solve problems, if that's the real objective. I'm really looking at people that, um, that, that are that just want to create, mm. and in the process of creating, they will they have the potential to build something really cool. We don't actually know what that is. Wow. So so we build stuff like like the projects. I'm working on two projects right now, and and the firm you know like said, hey, can you make a presentation to our board and tell them what you're building? And I said, um, sure, but I don't know what I'm building. <laughs> like. You know, and they're like, well, we don't, we don't just write a blank check. And I go, I go, you know, listen, I understand that, but it's entrepreneurs do not know what they're going to end up with. You just have to trust that they know how to get stuff done wow. and that they know how to, you know, and they, they, they kind of figure their way out. They figure their way along the way. And then they'll see as things develop, you know, which direction they want to go there's there's no way that you know when we built thinkersum at first we weren't even going to build a brokerage firm when we built tasty we had no interest in building a brokerage firm we were just going to build a network and the network completely morphed and then and then the brokerage firm came from the network so like wow we never know like you just don't know you know what you're going to end up building and you just start putting the pieces together and then it's, you see kind of what it morphs into and you have to kind of trust the process now it's a lot easier when you've had successes it's mm -hmm. like if i was trying to do this without any successes people would tell me to go jump in a lake <laughs> yeah you know but once you've had success they they have to respect the fact that you know okay i mean i'll tell you a funny story when we built tasty we had a private equity firm that invested in us when we were thinkersome and we went to the private equity firm. We said, we, you know, we're, we're going to raise some more capital for this. And they said, and we said, what do you think? And they're like, well, I mean, to be honest, we kind of hate the idea, but <laughs> we're just betting on you. And, and so they wrote us a check for 25 million and they wrote another check for 25 million again. Wow. And then, but the whole time they're like, you know, we really don't invest in media companies and we don't invest in financial media. This whole idea is so <laughs> ridiculous but we're just taking a shot that you're going to figure it out. And in the end, you know, they made, you know, a couple hundred million dollars on it. And they're like, yeah, that worked. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, so, so they bet on people too, but that's the whole thing. You know, like, like yeah. you just, you just don't know, you get certain privileges when you're successful that help. Yes. No question yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's beautiful just as an entrepreneur to hear you say what you just said, because I think there have been times just, along the journey for myself where I've been like, you know, I have to have this all figured out or I won't succeed. And to hear you say that kind of, it makes me uh, exhale a little bit, like maybe the messiness is okay. Oh, for sure. You, you don't, you, you cannot know, you know, what you're doing or building. Like, it's just, it's not possible. I mean, you know, you can look at some of the, the, the largest company in the world is Apple. 
and they didn't figure out what, what who they were until basically 20 some odd years after they launched. And they thought they were a music time for me. <laughs> yeah. I have I mean, five years left. <laughs> Just kidding. There's, there's nobody has, you know, like, like Steve Jobs had no idea what they were going to become. Yeah. Zero. And, and when you think about other companies, I mean, Amazon had no clue. They couldn't even raise any money. I mean, they basically, you know, um, you know, Bezos mortgaged, mortgaged his everything just to, just to find enough money to sell a few books. And I mean, and look how they, you know, look what happened there. And it, it's not, those stories are, you know, I mean, those are the mega monopolies that turned out to whatever, but you just don't know, yeah. you know, like, and, and I mean, there's no chance they thought, you know, when they started Amazon or Apple or anything else, there's absolutely no chance. And, and there's thousands of stories like that. It's not yeah. so, so, you know, I, when people come with a plan, I'm always like, Listen, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even like, you know, my favorite thing is people go, we need you to sign this NDA because we can't show you what we're working on until you sign an NDA. We're always like, uh, we haven't signed an NDA for 20 years and we're sure not signing yours. So, <laughs> so, and they look at, they look at you like what? And we're like, listen, you have an idea. We have 10 million ideas, probably the same idea you have maybe. <laughs> and right. I'm not signing anything. <laughs> so if you want to show it to us, great. And if you don't, I don't care. Don't show it to us. <laughs> and, and, and they're almost always, okay, we'll show it to you. And I'm like, yeah, of course. I go, we're not really interested in, you know, you know, exactly. we're interested in We own every idea. You own every idea. Everybody owns every idea. Exactly. But it's hard to make it all work. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But you make things work, Tom. All right. So help the listeners here make things work. Let's talk about the law of large numbers. I find that to be fascinating. I you taught it to me listening to you explain it. So please talk about that because it's so, so well, interesting. We have a philosophy, which is kind of trade small, trade often. And the reason we have that philosophy is because um, we believe that, um, we fundamentally believe that you, the more times you're able to do something, um, the greater chances you have of the outcome being what you assume the outcome should be mathematically so you know it's the classic if you if you throw up if you if you throw five coins in the air you know you could have five heads and zero tails you could have four tails and one head you know it's anything's possible but if you throw up five thousand coins you're going to be close to 2500 of each yeah. and that means that the more coins you throw up in the air the closer you're going to come to your expected outcome well, when you're trading strategically, and you got to remember the derivatives markets are incredibly efficient. Efficiency is not just liquidity. Efficiency, there's also price efficiency. Because if the markets are a penny wide, that means they're price efficient. Um, so the more times you do something, the closer you're going to come to whatever the average of wins and losses you expect to have. And that's kind of how we play the game. Yeah. And that's how we use law of large numbers in the world of, you know, um, in the world of trading. Now, it's very different. If you went to a casino and you do something 100,000 times, you're going to lose <laughs> because, because there's negative edge. Yes. And so when you have embedded negative edge of whatever it is, two, three, five percent, whatever it is, it's mathematically impossible. But in the financial markets, it's, there's no negative edge because the markets are only a penny wide. Yeah. yeah. So that's the difference. Perfect. Luke has I commandeered most of this conversation. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's Please. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tom, I wanted to ask you, uh, I'll, I guess I'll preface this question with, you know, a lot of what we do is around uh, trading psychology and emotional intelligence. Um, and I'm wondering your thoughts, I guess that's kind of a leading question because I've heard your thoughts before, but I want to, I'd love to have a conversation about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're not going to, you're not going to like my answer, Lucas. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not a good person with respect to trading psychology and the emotional side to it, because remember, I, I don't think there's, you know, when it comes to science and math, um, there's not a very big emotional component to it. Um, you know, and so the stock market may be emotional, but for me, trading is very unemotional. Mm -hmm. And so I don't believe if you've, if you haven't done something and you're trying to you know, learn it and, and there's, you're nervous or scared. I mean, sure, there's, a, there's an emotional, you have to make a few emotional decisions, things like that. But, 
But after you've done something, you know, a few thousand times or tens of thousand times, whatever, there's no emotion. I mean, you, you can get mad at yourself and you can, you know, just, you know, you can hate yourself for your timing and everything else. But the reality of trading for me, it is, it is, it's a math game. It's a scientific game. Um, it's not an emotional game. And so we don't spend a lot of time on the emotion, the emotional aspect of trading. It just doesn't fit into our methodology. Mm -hmm. That's all. So like, I mean, listen, and that's not the perfect answer for everybody. Cause I understand a lot of people, you know, like to hear different things. That's just, you know, that's just the way we treat it. Yeah. Do you, I'm Very just curious to answer. <laughs> do, you, do you think that comes your ability to just stay so neutral because of the math and science? Do you feel that comes because of your length of time and experience? I'm just curious if you go back maybe. to, yeah. Maybe, but um, maybe, you know, there, there's, there's um, you know, it, it's very possible. But I also think that most people that are really good at what they do, unless it's something where emotion, like for example, if, if I was an actor mm -hmm. or you know, um, in, some, in some way, I would think that you know, your ability to, to um, play the role emotionally and things like that is really important to you know, how successful you can be and to, to, be, to really um, you know, live in the moment of that part, things like that. But in the game of, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm hiring a scientist or I'm hiring, you know, a mathematician, I'm not looking for somebody that's very emotional. And if I'm hiring a trader, I'm for sure not looking for somebody that's emotional. Right. So, um, you know, I want, I want people that can be mechanical. I want people that can understand the math. I want people that can understand, you know, probabilistic outcomes and statistical outcomes and assess risk based on possible outcomes, not what they think. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's a very different approach. It's taken us a long time to get here. Yeah. And, um, and anyway, that's, you know, so that's why we focus mostly on, you know, quantitative stuff. And yeah. we're very unemotional about trading. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is the only way to be successful as a trader is to be as neutral as possible. Um, I, I, you know, we've just seen that not, not be the way a lot of people in initially operate. They've not learned how to find that neutrality. Um, and and I can I can understand that. I can yeah. appreciate that. And that and that's what I feel is you know it, they have to like you talk about the know how they have to have that know how but after they've acquired that at a certain point it's like if you are not successfully finding yourself neutral and you're being triggered on a win or a loss that's going to get in your way and we just don't want that to get in people's way um, this quote I didn't have time for this part of the conversation but it seems perfect now. I love this quote of yours, volatility is fear. It's the pricing of fear and fear is a short-term emotion. Talk to us about that, such a powerful quote. Um, you know, you can, I use this business um, or I look at this business as a way to um, use, to drive opportunity through fear. Um, so, the, when people get scared, um, they they do some weird things. You know, they bid up prices for things. They move markets more than they should. They get um, they, they lose a little bit of of you know their rationality, and they um, have a tendency to let things get a little sloppy. Mm -hmm. uh, as a trader, you know what you're looking for is opportunity as measured by excess noise in the market, which is also another word you can say for volatility. So we look at, at a rise in volatility as actually being synonymous with, you know, um, a rise in, in opportunity because of the fear level going up. Um, and so that, that's just how we think of it. Um, and, and that's where that quote comes from. You know, it's just, it's, it's actually, you know, trading is one of the few, uh, not one of the few, it's probably the only business in the world 
where there's actually a fear measure. So yes. like, I can't think of another thing where, where fear is actually tradable. Yes. So, you know, volatility has a two-sided market that's one tick wide, which means that fear basically lives in a tradable marketplace. And when you think about that, you know, that's really cool. And so, um, and it's not, so it's not, so fear is not a crazy emotion that, um, like that's very one dimensional. It can, it can be both, you can buy it or sell it. Yes. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Um, what are the mishaps, trading mishaps that taught you the most? I have about, uh, about 10 million of those. Um, <laughs> you know, I still, you know, I mean, it gets back to mostly to trade size. So yes. my biggest, my biggest screw ups are all like me thinking I know something, you know, um, and I do it a lot, you know, like I haven't had a very good week this week. I've completely messed up. Um, you know, I misjudged a couple of stocks and, you know, and let some positions get away from me. Um, I, my screw ups are almost all size. Mm, wow. Because sometimes I get my, you know, all successful traders have a pretty big ego. And mm -hmm. as much as we try to suppress our ego and try to be normal, you know, we still do stupid things. And I'm one of those. <laughs> uh, you're, you're, a, you're a lot more than just that. Crypto, where, where do you stand with crypto personally, with, your, with the business? What, what's your, what do you think most people miss about crypto? I think most people miss that crypto is essentially um, digital assets have been validated as a legit asset class. Mm -hmm. And I think people that have not bought any crypto, it doesn't have to be a lot, it could be just a tiny little bit. But if you haven't dabbled in crypto, like, you know, bought some Ether, bought some Bitcoin or Solana, or Cardano, or, you know, whatever it might be, um, you know, I, I think you're really missing out on understanding that there are software-based asset classes that are going to play a huge role in the future of decentralized finance. And it's, it's to me, absolutely ridiculous to think that digital assets will not be here in the future. Um, I think there's going to be regulatory clarity and the space is going to explode. What, what I mean by that is I don't necessarily think crypto prices are cheap by any stretch. Like I'm not one of these people that think Bitcoin's going to 150,000 or Ether's going to 10,000 or any of that kind of stuff. I don't think crypto is cheap at all. In fact, it may be overpriced, but I do think, especially after watching this conflict in Ukraine and what's going on, the most stable asset class of anything was the digital asset marketplace. And I think it's been very well validated over the last couple of months, last couple of years. Um, I think that the um, digital assets and decentralized finance are going to play a monster role in the next decade. And if you're not at least dabbling, you know, just like, you know, getting your feet wet in crypto, you're really missing out and you're putting yourself behind in understanding kind of what the next generation of kind of globalized finance is going to look like. Wow. Lucas, did you have another question? No, I think I, I would want to talk more about crypto as well. Just the idea of, uh, you know, the, I feel like there's a lot of, you know, fear of missing out on crypto um, yeah. that has happened. And, yeah. but then also the inverse of that is true, right? When it, you know, it, back in 2017, when there was that fear of missing out and then it was, you know, went parabolic and then there's the uh, capitulation up there. So, um, yeah. I, don't, I, I think you're right. I think there there is some fear missing out, but I think that's that's subsided somewhat. And now I think it's a legit asset class. I just wonder, you know, which which digital assets actually survive, yeah. which digital assets flourish, which digital assets, you know, are we going to use in a um, in a more commercial not not like transactional sense, but in a more commercial sense. And I wonder how big a role, you know, like NFTs are gonna play, how big a role digital collectibles, how big a role swaps are gonna play. You know, I mean, I can't imagine a world without smart contracts, without, you know, all the stuff that's coming down the pipe, that's all. Yeah, yeah. 
Tom, what do you think is the most important thing for individual investors and traders to just be mindful of in the midst of this volatile market now? We didn't say the date, but I'll say it now. It's March 24th, 2022. Um, I think in, in a, um, you know, you, remember, you gotta remember the world's always an uncertain place. So mm -hmm. it's not like March 24th, 2022 is any different than March 24th, 2023 or 2021 or 2019 or 2026. We're always gonna be sitting here going, oh my God, what's next? Um, so I think that, uh, you know, just engaging, recognizing um, that the markets are really interesting, engaging in different strategies, engaging in different opportunities, um, not being afraid to play, being indifferent to product, you know, like I said, testing the waters in different things, maybe it's crypto, maybe it's something else. I think it's all massively important to to the future of wealth creation, um, to wealth, you know, um, to stay wealth stabilization, uh, to, to, and probably more important than, than all the wealth crap is it's really important to your psyche in the sense that, um, I think the more, you know, and the more you can articulate about, you know, finance in 2022, uh, the more interesting you're going to be as a person and the more, opportunity you're going to have in life as a, you know, as whatever it is that you're doing. So I, you know, would strongly engage people to, to do something, <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't care what it is, but just yeah. do something like, like to me, finance is not having a 401k and checking a box. Mm. Like that's very uninteresting, um, not satisfying and probably, you know, not going to help you much in 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't, didn't you say if you can order pizza, you can learn how to trade? I've said a lot of things over my life. That's <laughs> one of the things. Yes. Uh, yeah. I got into a fight with a professor at Harvard for saying, you know, for asking her if she could order a hot dog when she said she can't trade, you know, that, yeah, that didn't go over. <laughs> um, so now it's I have, I have. I have put my foot in my mouth many times over the years. Um, I wasn't <laughs> too upset about that one, but still. It's so refreshing it's though, to be honest, because you speak your mind and you're so um, authentic. Like you, you, we well, know- what That's just, you earn that. You earn the right to be stupid sometimes, you know, and you earn the right to, you know, if you talk a lot, you're gonna say some things that you're gonna regret, but at the same time, you know, you know, we've earned the right to say things that in some cases, you know, will piss people off. Like, you know, we'll say things politically that piss people off. We'll say things, you know, socially that piss people off or, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll go down topics like, you know, religion that, that make people mad. And, and they're like, listen, stick to trading, Tom, stick to trading. <laughs> stick to trading. I, I get it. I get it. You know, but we're talking, we're having fun. It's not personal. That's right. You know? That's right. Well, the last question I ha wanted to ask you was, I just caught in one of the interviews that you talked about your dad being a civil rights attorney. And I just am curious, do you feel your upbringing and having your dad do that informed this, you know, outlier you, you, I feel like you are a fighter for the underdog. And I just am curious, do you see well, that connecting? Well, my dad, when I was little, my dad was a Jewish attorney from New York, very smart guy. I mean, he went to Yale Law School, you know, he was a professor at Yale, whatever, but crazy smart guy. But, you know, he moved to Mississippi for two years to live with, you know, live with, um, a couple of different black families that needed legal help, you know, and didn't get paid a dime, you know, I mean, that's real sacrifice. I mean, I teach somebody, you know, how to sell a naked strangle, you know, like, <laughs> like, I don't consider my, I don't consider my, my gift to humanity, you know, nearly, um, my dad was much more passionate about, you know, about the stuff he believed in. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, he would have taken a bullet for, you know, for a cause. Um, mm -hmm. My causes are, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know if he was a socialist or not. I can't figure it out. You know, like I don't know what he, you know, in the end, I'm not sure. But um, you know, he was very, um, 
very emotional, very passionate, and you know, spent his entire career supporting people, you know, supporting causes that that when people didn't have money to pay lawyers. So basically, you know, First Amendment this and that and everything else. Um, you know, I feel mine is my mission is very different. I don't feel like I, you know, I deserve the same kind of, you know, I've had more monetary success than him. I mean, he didn't ever make any money, but um, I'm not sure that, you know, in, in the big picture, I'm not sure what I've done is anywhere close to what he's done, what he did. So I, I don't know the answer. I, I understand. I, I do. I, I myself though just see that correlation of standing up for people who don't necessarily have a voice. And I think individual traders and investors, they they haven't been given a voice. Yeah. But I think your products and your services and your incredibly robust free content does give them that voice and autonomy and, and empowerment, which really is all anybody needs. You need that step up to be able to own it. And I feel a lot of the work you've done facilitates that for people. We've worked off of, of a, what we call a goodwill model. We give everything away and we just ask the people, you know, if you like what we do, use our technology. And it's been, it's been a very, you know, great relationship with literally hundreds of thousands or millions of people. And, you know, I'm thankful that we've had the opportunity to pull this all off and, um, and we continue to do it today, even though we don't have to, but we still love it. And I hope I do it until, you know, I mean, that I, I, I'm a private equity investor once said that the only reason we invested in you, cause you're going to die in your chair working. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that's a reason I'll take it. <laughs> well, maybe that's why you don't have a hobby Yeah, because you're, cause you're, you're living your bliss. You're living your bliss, as Jim Campbell talks about. You are yeah, living your like, bliss. Like tonight, I'm doing a podcast with you, and then I'm doing a, um, and then I'm doing a a, a live um, show on Twitch after this, and then I'm doing a um, a lecture at Boston University after that tonight. I mean, it's my life, you know. And, and but but listen, I wouldn't trade it, Kim, for anything. Like I don't care. I don't give a crap if I don't get to go out to dinner tonight, you know, like or whatever. Like I don't care, you know. Like this is what I do. I love it. It's, it and it shows, and it shows, and it was just out of you, and it makes so many people around you love it too. So thank you for the contribution you are to so many, and thank you for coming on my podcast. You yeah. rock, Tom. That was great. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Lucas. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So so much. This is the Wall Street Coach Podcast with Kim Ann Curtin. You can download Kim's free ebook, Discipline and Finding Your Edge, at TraderDiscipline.com. And learn more about working with Kim and her team at TheWallStreetCoach.com. And if you're feeling generous, please leave a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening.